perspective of the world and a record of the time, as well as an alternative to some of the major media outlets up and including to Gormley here in Saskatchewan. And this week is a very special week because I've not one, maybe not even two, but possibly three people, depending on whether or not uh, the third person is kind of there in the background somewhere. And so today we've got here a good friend, Chris Griska, still there, Chris? Still here, yep. As well as I, Patricia Whitebear, who is a running a very special group here in Saskatoon, which we're going to get into in a moment. But I wanted to get this particular show started leading from the previous couple of shows and the, the things that have been going on in the world. We've got COVID going on, the governments around the world are reacting to it, and there's been tr tens of trillions of dollars spent and thrown around. Uh, so, But from your perspective, Chris, what does the situation we're in mean to you, and, and how do you see this unfolding? Oh, that's okay. Well, I think me personally, how I've been affected is you know, the, the new norm is working from home. The new norm is not going out to see friends or family, not going out to enjoy any external entertainment, uh, living in your home, right? Um, which is, is a bit challenging when you have three young kids. But so far, everyone has been very flexible. Now, where it is going or where our path leads is really uncertain right now because we are seeing a recent announcement in cases where COVID for people that have tested positive and then negative have retested positive again. Coming out of South Korea, there are 91 confirmed cases of COVID that has been either reactivated, they're unsure, or either reactivated or reinfected. And so they don't know if there's a mutation that has started going around with it already, but it means that where we all thought we could wait for a vaccine and we all thought once we had at least had that vaccine, we could be vaccinated and move forward with our lives again and we could all maybe not stop washing our hands, but we could all get back to some sort of normal schedule. I don't really see that that's on the board for any time in the near future anyway. So I, given that, though, assuming that that is true, that we're in for some kind of really long haul struggle, both on yep. as individuals and at a society level. And given, I mean, you, you have a family, you have daughters, looking forward a little bit, or how do you see handling this as we kind of go forward? And what would that mean to you? Um, well, handling this going forward is a, is a really tough question because we all know that the powers of be, uh, i.e. our politicians, don't always do the most sensible things that everyone thinks they should to try and get us to a different spot. We've seen that in our trade relations. We see that in our local policies, our provincial policies, our federal policies. What I believe that we could do to move forward or what we should be looking to do to move forward is to implement, we're going to have to at some point, start reintroducing ourselves, our, our society back together. We're not in a society that we could stay on our computers and away from everyone indefinitely. We can do it for a month, we can do it for a couple months. If you're looking at like a couple of years of us all just sacrificing that time out of our lives, I'm not sure it's in the majority of people's natures to be able to do that. So we're going to have to start doing small gatherings, right? Because I want my kids to 
go to school and get a real education as good as I am not at teaching, I think it'd be very beneficial for them to go and integrate into a school solution and for them to gain social awareness and intelligence that they're not going to necessarily gain at home. Okay, so um, now, I, before we get too kind of deep into how much we are all struggling with taking care of the roles that the government would normally be doing, and yeah. at least we'd hope that it would be doing a little bit more in our lives, perhaps. Patricia, tell... So you run a group here in Saskatoon. So let, t tell me a little bit about this group that you run and where where that came from. Well, the group is called Crystal Neff Family Caring Support Circle. And it came about uh, because at the time I had a loved one that was, was struggling. It was now her... I was actually trying to get help for her, and uh, she had been clean for eight months. She had gone through a day program for treatment, and I thought everything was going okay. Um, she got her own place, and then I got word from a relative on the street that uh, there were some changes and that she was struggling. Um, and then she was now missing uh, certain events like family birthdays, so it, it was distressful. So I happened to be talking to other parents, and they were going through similar things, like how do you get your loved one who has an addiction, how do you get them help, who do you call? So I started making those calls one after another, and it was like a triangle. I'd get one, and you'd get bounced up to another one, and that one was too busy or, you know, referred me to someone else, and it was like a never-ending triangle and with no help, no counseling of any kind. It was very, very stressful. And then I happened to be watching CTV News, and there was a, a recovering addict on doing a television news interview, and I thought if she can do it, you know, maybe this is where I have to reach out for, like speak to the people that are going through it, and then I'll understand it, because if I don't understand what they're going through, like I have to research and I have to know about the drug and how does it affect how does it affect one and how does it affect the brain, the physical, the spiritual and all of that. So I reached out to CTV and they wanted to do a story. So it was aired in the beginning of November, first week in November. And during that interview I sent out a, an email, Crystal Meth Helps Saskatoon at gmail.com and that night I got an a remarkable response from people that were reaching out from recovering, that were reaching out, people that Parents, siblings, grandparents looking for help. They didn't know where to go, and they thought it was a great idea that I was interested in starting a support circle so we could get together, discuss it, and come up with solutions and help each other heal. And I knew that we, if we stood together and prayed together, worked on it, that we would either find solutions or we would find comfort, you know, to support each other. So now what I'm finding kind of interesting about your, your story so far as I've heard it is how the local government, at least, there are programs for addiction, but it d doesn't seem that when you were describing your experience going through it, you, you kind of described it as a triangle where you're being kind of bounced around from one department to another and where there were cracks to fall through. And this was during a time when the government is still kind of working at a normal level. Right. And right now, there's a lot of people out there, and possibly even some people listening to this, that don't have coping skills or don't have a lot of resources in their life to keep them from falling into addictions. And this is one of the things that I've even seen, even just on my social media feeds, people normalizing and describing they're falling into this kind of a trap. Now, crystal meth or otherwise, it's something that I think a lot of people are falling into right now. So. Might as well start with the government side. So as far as the being picked around different departments, how did that go? Well, it was very uh, troubling because you're already in distress. You're already pushed to the point of, okay, you've already, you, you're worried about your loved one. So what do you do? You get in your vehicle and you search. You drive around and you drive around and you try to find them. You try to help them. And you don't yet realize, you know, you try to either give them money or gift cards or food or whatever, just so they're not struggling. You don't want to see them struggle out there. And that insanity leads you to you know, your own physical well-being is you know, in jeopardy because you're not sleeping well, you're not eating, you're not looking after your health. And in my particular case, and other parents, whatever, or grandparents, 
were raising their grandchildren. I mean, it's not something our child intended to do, but it was addiction usually comes from underlying circumstances. There may be past multi-generational trauma, either through hereditary addictions, or else it comes from residential schools, 60 scoop, like in our Indigenous community, the day schools, whatever. But it, the, the drug crystal meth is not... It doesn't discriminate against anybody. So we know that it doesn't matter what background you come from, what social status, you're working, you're not working, you know, it doesn't matter on the age, it doesn't matter on your race, it doesn't discriminate. So it can affect anybody. So the, the first thing that you back, think about is back, next back door. A, a little bit uh, on Chris's side. So Chris, you're, you're a parent and you've raised one daughter seemingly successfully and you've, you've gone through you must have by now gone through many different kinds of stress where they were kind of going out into the world. And now, given that we're looking ahead and seeing this lack of available resources, lack of social contexts where that are healthy, that children have access to, from your perspective, what do you see that parents can be doing right now to kind of avoid that happening or, or something like it happening to like if if one if one of your your newer daughters were falling into this kind of a trap, how would your response be, and what what do you see as the uh, outcome of that? We've uh, it's it's interesting it's an interesting job because we've had we've had family who has died of overdose to fentanyl, and which is though not chemically similar, the addiction is similar, and I think. What I would personally do and what I have done is make sure that my children understand and know A, the risks, and B, the outcomes, so that they know that if they're going to be taking drugs and these are the drugs they choose to take, this is what's going to happen to them. This is how it's going to hurt them, and this is how it's going to hurt the family too. When you have people that are hooked on things, who are addicted to things, they don't often like even in in that mindset they're not really caring about their about the other people in their lives right and so they don't always see after they're already hooked on something they don't always see how it's hurting everyone around them it's something that a lot of people with addiction struggle to get to where they actually see and understand how their actions have affected everyone around them i don't there's no like i have no silver bullet I have no magical answer that say, do this and you'll be fine. But I mean, you know, taking the time, taking the patience to try and be with them and to incorporate them more wholly into your lives can help. I think the government has a level of responsibility here because, in my opinion, if we had a better management of drugs, and I don't mean like restricting drugs or criminalizing drugs, if we allowed people to better manage drugs and manage addictions with prescriptions, with over-the-counter items, we would probably be better off and lose less people in society. We can't always stop people from doing weird shit, but if we made things better, safer drugs, safe safe injection sites, whatever available, we can mitigate how we can help people change from those behaviors. So, right? so back, back to Patricia. Now, hearing that, because you, you have lived through the other side of that, where from the perspective of someone who's lived through the other side, how much sense does that make? Is there something about that perspective that is that resonates with you, etc. Most definitely, because, you know, I feel that the government has to take a lead role and our leaders in the health authority um, and the frontline, uh, you know, outreach workers, whatever, everybody has to realize that there's a stigma there and we have to overlook that stigma. It's not a moral, an issue of morality or why do they do that? You know, they should know better and, and blame, blame, blame. Well, you know what? Some of them just take the drug because they don't have enough confidence. It could be a peer issue. So we need education on that, on the stigma. And it should begin in the schools. So we need to have some sort of portfolio where we're looking at, uh, you know, how do we educate them, like get them young and educate them. Because, you know, if we stop talking about the issue until they're older, I'll tell you right now, the gangs are looking at younger and younger people. So the age limit is really dropping, and that is really, really scary. I've had parents talk to me about 12-year-olds. 
It's not scary. And we don't know exactly what's in those drugs, whether it be methamphetamine or crystal meth or, or one of the opioids. Like, there's a mixture out there. And now, there for a while, you know, with the borders being shut and, and uh, it has a way of getting to Saskatoon, we know that. But we don't know what meth labs, what, how are they making it. We don't know what they're putting into it. Like you said, fentanyl, it's, it's out there. But it's also in with the crystal meth. We know that. And also, um, we've heard about bath salts. Like, these things are scary, and our youth, our, our young ones, need to know about that. We need to give them a safe sense of security at home. So if we have addictions at home, we better start dealing with that you know, at our own level you know, and make a safe surrounding for them so that you know, it's not so easy to be persuaded or coerced into uh, the gangs what they do is they give them out a free sample so they're going to try it it's going to get rid of their you know they had a rough time at home they're going to go out and reach for that because it's so easy and it's so cheap if they give it to them free well then they just go out and sell it and they get their profit and they keep going so it's we need education absolutely and it needs to so be a priority on those kind of continuing on that so chris from again your parent your daughters i mean none of our the children are really immune to this like as, as much as we'd like to imagine that oh this couldn't possibly happen to this person or this person the public school system is you, you roll the dice as soon as the child is sent to it as far as what the outcome is and we can prepare them a lot but from from that perspective do you have any questions of, of the, the person who has kind of lived through it from as far as what you see or anything, any uncertainties that you have about the process of how, how it could happen or how it happened, et cetera? Uh, well, no, I like, I mean, I understand how it happens. And it's like Patricia said very much so. It's like, it's it's almost, it's interesting because in the, in the 30s, there was like a big smoking campaign where they were handing out free cigarettes to people uh, going to war specifically. And it's like, they knew if they weren't smoking when they left, they'd be smoking by the time they got back and they'd be hooked for life. Right. And it's, it's like, it's it's a very similar mindset where they are, they're baiting the children into it. I think with the whole COVID-19 piece that has come up, I don't know how effective it's going to be in the gang, like in the gang situation, if the gangs can't really get together, right? If they're not, if they're not getting together, I guess that'd be a question that I would have is, well, are there still, you know, gangs out there hanging out, doing things together? Or has that kind of been shut down with this whole COVID thing? Uh, I don't know if, if you know the answer to that, Patricia, but it'd be interesting to find out, right? Well, we know that gangs, their main goal is not about keeping our youth safe or it's all about money. They want to make money. They have to make money. So that means they'll do what they have to and they find ways. They are very, very ingenious when it comes to ways of getting around either the justice system or the family in general. They will use the family as well. So it's just something that's going to, they may find different ways of, of presenting themselves or getting together without alerting uh, the law, but they will find ways most definitely. And, and my worry is that uh, the ones that are on the street, the homeless and, and the addicts, they don't have access to uh, updated information. We have it because we get it on ourselves. It comes on the news. We read it in the papers. We use social media. Some of them have cells, which they may, may or may not have Wi-Fi. They usually go to places that have Wi-Fi or they use uh, their social media on at the libraries, which are all closed now. So they are in an extremely high category, high risk category right now. Where do they go for their basic needs? I was so happy to hear that uh, Shane Partridge and his group had set up um, a place to reach out and help people when they needed housing or applying for or, uh, services. And that was, you know, they were giving up over their time, putting themselves at risk to help the homeless. Because a lot of the homeless, they don't have any ID, they have no health card, they have no government ID, no bank account during this crisis. So I mean, we have all those things and it's still hard for us. And how do they physically distance themselves from each other on the streets? Well, you know, they're in their drug psychosis. They may forget or the drug psychosis is they're in another world, right? Right. So yeah. And, and I have heard as of this week the first at least rumors of COVID positive people on the street in Saskatoon who were not being necessarily addressed by the healthcare system for again whatever reason perhaps they were in some kind of a psychosis state. Now, as far as given that we we've not only got this loss of public service 
a loss of people having access to things like the public library and literally a million people within the past two weeks uh, losing their jobs and then suddenly finding that they need some kind of a source of income. I mean, the gangs do offer, at least some people, that kind of access to money or at least access to the potential of being involved in a system that can take care of you. And to me, that's kind of the one of the scary parts of this, is that regardless of whether or not they get caught physically being in the same place as each other and being kind of frustrated on that level, it seems like there's a, a lot of people falling through the cracks very quickly right now. Depending how the gangs react is going to determine a lot of what happens to the, the children here in Saskatoon. And so that kind of worries me a little bit. But you mentioned one project of people kind of setting up infrastructure for other people. Is, is there, for both of you, is, is there other projects like that going on in your life where people could use help in helping other people? Because right now we kind of need to learn about these things. And your Facebook group, Patricia, is certainly one of them. But right now is kind of the time to be learning about not just places you can go and rely on, but places where those of us who still have a little bit of a ability to help out, places we can go. So, Chris, is there in Regina anything that you're kind of involved or aware of that could use more help or could use more anything? Me personally aware of? Unfortunately, I'd say no. Like, I mean, the in my in my personal circle right now, everyone is staying at home. Anyone who isn't staying in or, like, cannot work from home has gone on the federal assistance plan. So there isn't a lot that a lot financially they could use, but, like, in a social aspect, very much so, right? There's people that are very bored, and and I would say in our in the people that I have in my life, in my life, in my world, drinking and drug use has gone up considerably since the since our kind of lockdown of society, which is to be expected, right? You trap everyone home and you give them nothing to do, and something has to change, and that that's what I've noticed changing, and it's just anecdotal as it's only everyone that I know, but the drinking side and the legal legal drug use has gone up. Um, I cannot say for illegal since I'm not generally in that world. I, I um, think on, on yeah. that side, and Patricia, you can correct me uh, if I'm wrong here, but I mean, our social circles can afford alcohol, right? And even with the CRDB benefit, there's there's kind of a, a social expectation that there, there's a certain cost we're willing to, to pay. Maybe it might not be expensive scotch or something like that, but now it's my understanding that meth is fairly cheap, and especially like when they're trying to get you hooked on it, it it's, it, it's kind of like a, a, a cheaper higher than that. So Patricia, am I kind of on the right track on this one? I'll let my recovering addict that's here with me, she wants to remain anonymous, but... Yeah. Um, most definitely. Uh, I'll maybe let her speak to that issue, but I, I definitely agree with you. Hello, Anonymous. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, uh, since my, my 28 days at Moxie treatment, I'm now six months sober, and I hear what you guys are talking about, like the gangs are trying to get people in because it's cheap. That's the, that's the sad thing is meth is pretty much dirt cheap right now because they're trying to get, the gangs are trying to get more people in their, in their circle, but then... Sorry, I'm nervous. It's totally okay. Yeah. And so, so where I, w I was kind of hoping to go with that is that it's it's kind of socially acceptable to have drug and addiction problems, even to the point where they're kind of affecting your life, as long as it's the right drug. And there's all kinds of things that I see every day on Facebook, almost bragging about being a, a mom and having a glass of wine to calm your nerves or whatever. And at the same time, there's, it's like a, the difference, a lot of it is about the, the poverty side of it, right? If you're not able to afford the right kind of high and you have nothing but time on your hands in a situation like we're all kind of trapped in our houses, uh, like right now, a lot of people are gonna fall into using drugs as a coping mechanism, whether it be alcohol or otherwise. And so now, Anonymous, from your perspective, now there's a lot of people probably listening to this who have not gone through what you've gone through and who have not seen things through your eyes and experienced this process. For those people who don't know and who would not have imagined going from a normal life or, or even not a normal life, however the, the process went, what, what would you say to them? How, how would you describe at least some of your experience to that that particular crowd who does not know and does not understand? I'm not too sure. I'd probably just something that they'd have to see through their own eyes, I guess. That's totally, I'm not too, too. totally fair. Now, 
can hurt for me personally. I have my relapse. Like, I'm trying not to relapse right now. I've been six months sober, like I said. Okay. And all I know is this going through my eyes was being on the street, selling, trading things to get what I needed. And uh, walk, walking, just wa- just wandering around, walking. And um, I actually walked it off instead of continuing using it. So I just go for a walk all around the city. It sometimes took days and sometimes took nights. But I'm glad to have, 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 sorry. It's okay. I'm just, yeah, I'm just glad that I'm here where, I, where I'm at, where I'm at right now, instead of back on the streets, because I didn't know where I was staying. I was, well, I had my own home, but I was, like, homeless because, because of an issue. So I'd always crash on everybody's couches and stuff. And that's not any way to, for anyone to live. For sure. But it does happen. Now, Patricia, back to kind of you. Now, you mentioned the one group that is helping people uh, with kind of basic things like connection to social media, et cetera. Now, is there any, uh, other than your group, uh, any other groups that you know of that could use help uh, in taking care of people in Saskatoon? Well, I think if the, uh, like my recovery peer did, she reached out and that was uh, the big thing. As long as they reach out and from an addict's point of view, I had trouble with alcohol years ago, not at um, binge drinking or anything like that, but still, or I came to the realization that I needed to get help, so I got help. And one of the main things was to get counseling, because there's always an underlying issue that's there, so it doesn't just come out of experimenting. Well, it may at first, I guess, or peer pressure, but so, you know, the, the whole family has to heal. When when the act is out there, the, the whole family is walking this journey together. And it's so important for the family to reach out. So that means if family members want to learn more about it, reach out to to Narcotics Anonymous, those types of programs, AA, um, and learn about what the addiction does. And research it. Go online if you can and research what you can about crystal meth and its effects and poly substance use. So that's the use of other drugs as well. I know the Saskatchewan Health Authority has the mental health and addiction services here for the Saskatoon area. They have a main access service line that you can contact. They do a centralized intake, and I can give you that number if you'd like. We well, we, we can kind of put, paste the number uh, late, later on, I, I think. But, later on. Uh, now, back kind of to, to Chris, that, that was kind of a, an interesting point that she made in that a lot of these underlying problems of how to, to cope with stress at the family level, like there, there is definitely a family level there. And so from your perspective, have you seen at the family level, and not necessarily your family, but just the, the family level generally, what would you recommend for people as far as coping with the stress that we're, we're seeing, everyone losing their jobs, everyone in the, in this kind of situation together? Um, I think the strongest thing for most families that kind of goes by the wayside fairly easily is communication. Communication in our family, when this all started going down within the first week, we realized how we weren't communicating um, and weren't communicating our feelings or what we were thinking. We would just go to each other and like with myself and my partner, we would go to each other and we'd say, hey, did you see this? Or hey, did you see this? And we weren't saying, hey, did you see this? This has me really bummed out. Like, I don't know what to think about this. It's It's scaring me, right? We were just we we're just showing each other these like tabloid newspaper like titles and being almost like, kind of like a, a point and grunt almost level of communication. Ex- exactly right. It was like it's like yeah we're reacting and yeah we're stunned, but then we weren't really communicating anything afterwards, right? And then, so that has come a long way to help us in our house just talk talk about things. And talk about our feelings, something that a lot of people, I guess, I won't say a lot of people, I don't know the statistics, but I would assume many people don't do. They don't often say, hey, this, I feel blah, right? Or I'm having this it come up for me, or I'm panicked, right? They, it's something that generally we wouldn't, we wouldn't in often in our household say. We would, we would just talk about what had happened, but there'd be no feelings or there wouldn't be like uh, this pressing anxiety, right? And that has helped us a lot. Now, unfortunately, we have three small kids, and so I can't say that my wife doesn't have a glass of wine because she does. But I think just changing the way that we communicate has has really helped 
us see each other understand each other how we're feeling about the different situations so so back to anonymous on patricia's side now we're talking about the communication within a family and that part is definitely important for getting the family unit to being able to cope but from your perspective is there anyone other than the, the crowd or the, the people that got you into the the downward spiral to begin with is there people outside of that and your family that you've been able to communicate with or has it just been primarily your your family on that side just primarily just primarily my mom okay i have a couple of supports on facebook but that's about it the people that kind of went down with me I haven't spoken with them at all okay. because they're still addicted and I don't want to go back and I don't want to go backwards to one foot in front of the other. Sadly, I had to walk away from them, the ones that got me hooked and stuff. And yes. It's sad, but you got, you got to change your circle if you're trying to get your mind right. And it is kind of a sign of being serious about it when you start making sure that the people in your life are the ones that you choose to be in your life for those kinds of positive reasons. Now, yeah, uh, pa Patricia, on your side, as far as the, again, communicating outside of the, the family structure, how what has your experience been with that? Now, both within it, the, the context of your group, this new group that you've made, as well as outside of that, has there been a broader social context that has been there for you? And how has that experience been? Well, I've had, I've learned a lot from, I had one, it was only one meeting that I went to with NA, but I managed to get a lot out of that one meeting because our group started up before then and I thought, well, it would be best if I'm going to talk about how people can reach out and get help, then I better do it myself. So I did and I learned quite a bit in one evening that I was there. And then I did a lot of research and, and learning, and talking to other parents that are out there struggling that are not part of the group. But also I learned from our recovering. The best way to learn about it is someone who's walked through that journey of the addiction and how they found their way back. Because no matter how much you try to solve things for your loved one who's an addict, it's gonna it's either gonna push them away or lead them into a deeper hole of addiction. So the best thing to do is to participate with them. But to learn that well at some point you have to let go with love. So we call it detaching with love. And we go by the three C's. I didn't cause it, I can't control it, and I can't cure it. And when you let it go, when you finally realize that the biggest help that I found before reaching out to other people was I just had to let it go to God. And that's what I did. Once I let it go, then I realized I had time for self-care. And if I wasn't taking care of myself and I was out there in the insanity of trying to find away and getting in this triangle of confusion, I, I, I needed to understand that once you let go, then you have to realize self-care, because then you can be the one that is there for the rest of the family, because this is a family journey. And then I realized, too, that I have to set boundaries and have a family plan. And like Chris said, family has to communicate. That is so important, and you have to learn to let go. So however you reach out, whether it be on social media or in person with other family members or just by getting out and being with nature, like in our Indigenous way, we go to the sweat lodge, which I've done many, to help the group and to help my loved one and to help the others that are out there on the street that haven't found the road back yet. So, and that's, that's always my, my way of doing things, is looking to the Creator and to use the seven teachings that we have. So, I was adopted so, and, it, it, and ripped away from my family, but I've learned it over the years that these things do work. So it's interesting that the sweat lodge is mentioned here. Now, my understanding of the science is this part hasn't been verified or vetted very much. And maybe Chris, you, you may even know a little bit more about this than I. But I was reading something this past week that somebody sent to me suggesting that a lot of the problem for COVID is a nasal and in the lungs. And the COVID virus is very sensitive to temperature. And one of the things mm -hmm. our bodies do to get rid of it is increase our temperature, try to kill the virus that has infected our lungs and nasal passages. And sweat lodges, one of the things they'll do is increase the temperature of the air substantially in that those same regions, among others. And so it may very well be that it is a possibly healthy thing for people who are suffering from COVID to have something like a sweat lodge or even just like a plain sauna. And now again, I, I'm not a doctor. This is not a place to get medical advice, but it's kind of interesting that there's this potential there for an old tool 
an old way of bringing health to people to kind of have new life. Now, but back to Chris, though. So as far as the, at the family level and the, at the level of self-care, and I guess cultivating a level of health at the family level, given the, the experience of the past month and, and being kind of stuck in uh, away from people, do you have any experience with that, or has there been anything like that in your your world? I'm sorry, experience with the new kinds of perhaps self care or new new oh self care yes yeah. well especially with our kids so the moment we found out that we were not going to be going into for, into work um, we took most of our savings which is probably foolish and I don't recommend anyone to necessarily do this but we took most of our savings and bought the kids a trampoline because we figured that that was going to be the biggest return on investment um, as we were all going to be stuck at home for the foreseeable future and it has has been really great getting the kids we don't have a large backyard but we have a, a nice enough backyard to have a trampoline and a little garden and it has been great to get the kids out of the house get them in the backyard jumping on a trampoline get them doing something because otherwise they would probably feel a lot more cramped and and kind of boxed in or caged, uh, yeah <laughs> yeah without it right so like we live just a couple doors down from a school and the school playground has all been closed down they, they've taped it all down they've erected gates around the or uh, fences around the gates so no one can go in and play on the play structures so like we're like our kids can literally look at the play structures they would love to play on um, and we're, which is a little bit torturous but um i think that has really helped us as for the parents like we're just trying to keep busy doing projects and, and things right so you know we've slowly let one of our bathroom lights die it has a uh, like fixed led lights in it uh, that we when we moved in we were like oh that's interesting and and it's like it's it was down to its last two bulbs out of five or something and we're like well we i guess we need to replace this now because we couldn't actually disassemble it or take it apart so we we have been doing projects like that to just keep us busy and keep us sane baking which has been a big thing uh, we've been doing some baking lots of home cooking but i don't think anything can really replace human contact because i know we're all and when, when someone stops by at the door even six feet eight feet out they'll stand and we'll just we're just so excited we'll come and just chat with them for like 20 minutes because it's just we have no no other contact right yeah, so. I've, I've heard stories of people being excited to hear telemarketers for example uh, and being willing to like strike up conversations with them. But we are getting to near the end of the show. So anonymous person in the corner there, is there anything that you would like to tell the world maybe about your experience or otherwise, now that you've oh, kind of got their attention? Oh, I'm sorry, she just left, but she wanted to wish everyone well and to stay on their good journey and it can happen. And that's what she, she wanted to say that just keeps Keep at it. Keep at it. If you relapse, just keep at it. Have faith. You can do it. That was what she said. But she had to leave. I'm sorry. No problem. And as for yourself, Patricia, given maybe a, the, if you want to talk, mention the, the Facebook page or anything like that, but definitely anything you'd like to, to tell the world about your group, and now is your chance. Oh, well, right now, because of the social, I mean, physical distancing, we aren't able to have our weekly support circles. But when we, uh, just a little bit about the circle, we use, um, like we have a, an elder that comes in. So I thought the best way to do it, because we have, it, it doesn't discriminate to just any race. So we know that it affects anybody and everyone. So our group is for everyone, but we try to use some of the basic knowledges to teach people about the sweat watch, to teach people about um, medicines that can help. And actually, we had, or I have, planned for future gatherings that we have with the circle. And we hope the circle gets bigger. We want more more families to come and, and partake and, uh, you know, share their stories and get it off their chest because uh, we as a sounding board can help because we've been through it. We know where they're at and we can help uh, comfort them in, in their times of, challenges but so we use an elder uh, she comes in she's so grateful to uh, gratefully donates her time she helps us with an opening prayer and then we have a knowledge keeper and she shares our, our teachings and then we get down to the basics and I usually give them messages of hope and I quote from the AA book or the NA book I use a lot of comforting, inspirational books or resources that they can use to get more information to help them with their self-care. 
And we provide speakers to come in to explain, like from SUS Health Authority and from other elders that can come in or storytellers and people that can help us on our journey. And we just hope that when this is, we're clear to meet again, so that we can walk together in a good way and help each other because that's what this community community needs. The frontline workers that are right in the midst of it in, in Riversdale and Pleasant Hill area, they need the support too. So like there's businesses there that are struggling and how do they deal with the COVID? And well, most of them are, are closed now, but still it's, it's hard. It was hard for them and will be hard for them once this clears up and the problem may be not as bad, but the problems may still be there. But yeah, so people can visit the Crystal Meth Help Saskatoon Facebook page and uh, just learn a little bit more about it. And, and I appreciate that uh, you've given us this time to come and talk. And I personally appreciate that you are giving out hope and helping people find that comfort in these particular times, especially because yeah. this is definitely something that we need more of right now. And it's good to hear at least of one source of comfort and hope for people, especially in the Saskatoon Riversdale. And finally, Chris, is there anything you'd like to tell the world uh, now that you've got the world's attention? Oh, wow. That's, uh, let's see. What does the world need to know? I think Patricia Meshers was spot on that, uh, like addictions, everyone just needs to keep trying with the social distancing thing as well. It's a struggle for lots of people to remain in isolation for extended periods. I think one thing I would like to see is uh, the possibility of starting doing uh, nearly instant blood tests, which are being produced by the by a company in Canada, which we are currently exporting to U.S. and U.K. markets, but has not been implemented in Canada. So our frontline workers can know if they've been infected or can know if they are able to work in a possibly already infected area with a bit more ease and a little bit more confidence because they've already contracted and have gone through the um, the COVID-19 or if they're inherently immune to it, right? Because they have discovered people out there that just do not seem to be affected by it. So that information would be incredibly helpful, being able to know where the contours of infection are and who is and is not infected would be really helpful in narrowing and kind of closing down the scope of this thing. Oh, exactly. Right. It's like it's one of our pathways to move forward past, you know, everyone just stay in and do well. Now we know we can. There are some people that can go out and it's OK. Right. All right. So I'm going to fade off this stream, but not with the goodbye song uh, this week again. But the if you did enjoy this show, uh, definitely consider going to the subscriber star dot com slash Jeff dash cliff. I am s still seeing more and more of my hours being cut this week personally. So that every little bit helps. But other than that, hopefully you enjoy and I will see you all next week. Ciao.